Well, on behalf of the Northeast family here, as has already been stated so well, we are glad that you are here with us this morning. Those of you who are uh, members and those of you who are guests as well, whether you're joining us here in person or joining us online. Uh, I'm grateful to be a part of this church. I am not the regular pulpit minister here at Northeast, for those of you uh, who don't know that. I think most everybody uh, knows that, but Noah, our regular pulpit minister, is out of town. He is at uh, the Harding Lectureship, and he went with his dad, and he is really enjoying uh, that time with him down there, and we look forward to his return. I want to just mention a couple of things before we get into our lesson this morning, and that is some things that are coming up. Remember, next Sunday is uh, our Mission Sunday, and so everything that, that we give over and beyond our regular uh, contribution uh, will go exclusively toward mission work and will be designated for that. So keep that in mind as you're planning and thinking about your giving in the next week or two. Please keep that in mind. That's something very important to us in terms of our mission to the world. Also, to reiterate the video that you saw just a minute ago, uh, this coming Wednesday down here in the lower lobby will be our kickoff meeting for our midweek uh, activities for this coming fall. And so we look forward to you being there. Um, uh, food will be provided. We're asking everybody to bring a dessert or something to drink. And we'll get that kicked off and look forward to that time of fellowship and study in the coming weeks. And one other thing, next week we start our new Bible classes as well. So keep that in mind. I believe we have brochure. Do we have brochures right out here that have the information? They can go to the bulletin. They can check on the website and see what we're doing next week. So as you're uh, selecting classes, Bible classes at 930 on Sundays, you can get all the information about those classes and where they will be. Uh, this week. I want to ask you a question before we uh, get started. Actually, it's kind of a segue into what we're going to be talking about this morning. And that is this question. If you could have a superpower, and you think of all the, the Marvel uh, comic characters and all the others, there are, there are so many who, super power, uh, superheroes out there right now, I cannot keep up with them. Back when I was a kid, you know, it was Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, uh, The Flash, and maybe a couple of others. The Hulk maybe back then, but now look, look at it. There's so many of them now, it's hard to keep up with them. But, uh, you know, there's this uh, part, of, part of us that's fascinated with, with uh, those, who, those that are superheroes, and sometimes we identify with them, and we think, man, it'd be so cool to have the ability to you know, have amazing strength or to be super fast. Um, if you could have one of those superpowers, what would it be? I'm tempted to ask somebody up front this morning. Luther, I'm putting you on the spot. What would it be? If you could have one, like a superpower. Be rich. Be rich, no, man. Okay. Buddy, you threw me off there. That's not what I was looking for. I was looking like, you know, amazing strength, for me, it would be the ability to fly. I've always been fascinated with flight. And even today, if a plane flies overhead, I pause and I look up at that because I am just so totally amazed at that. Or I see a bird that's flying and it seems so effortless and above the world and gliding. And I think, ah, oh, that would be so neat. In fact, a couple of times through the years, I've actually had a dream that I could fly. Only a couple of times. And it was so, it was so, that dream was so cool that I'm thinking, I'm actually doing it. I'm flying. I can't believe it. It's funny, now when I dream that I like fall off a cliff or, or something, I just go splat to the, <laughs> to the bottom. So I don't know what that says about me psychologically. But think about this, and I'm looking at it from the angle of who we are and what we have in Jesus. And it's amazing to think that we have such a superpower in prayer. We believe that prayer is the ability 
to come in touch with and to communicate with and to appeal to and partner with, on a very intimate, personal level, the almighty God of the universe. I don't know everything that you believe about God. Beliefs even in this auditorium might be varied, but to those who believe in an almighty creator God of the universe, who is sovereign over all, who invites us into a relationship with him and a partnership with him in how we pray, we think of, of power and might and influence and we sometimes are impressed when we have a brush with greatness or meet somebody who's rich or famous or powerful. Think about your life. Who's the most famous person you ever met? The most powerful, influential, known figure for, for me as much as I hate to say it, it's Jerry Reed of uh, Smokey and the Bandit fame, all right? <laughs> That's not really big time. But I remember when, when Jeannie and I were still at, at Lipscomb, and I think it was some special occasion because we were eating at Old Charlie's. And when you're in college, Old Charlie's is the big time. So I don't know if it was some event, but we went to Old Charlie's to eat, and lo and behold, across the room was Jerry Reed. And I remember how excited I was about that. And I can't remember what I did, but I wanted to go up and talk to him and just you know, chew the fat with this, uh, with this famous actor. And I think Jeannie was telling me, don't go over there, don't go over there, don't go over there. And I can't remember if I did or not. But, but this idea of being in the presence of, of greatness. I mean, think about it. How many of us right now if we wanted to, could get in touch with the president and say, look, hey, I want to talk to the president. How many, right, you, you call the White House and say, hey, look, this is Grady Smith. I'm down in, near Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'd like to talk to the president. Can you, can you put him on the line? That wouldn't, that wouldn't happen. I mean, you, you don't get an audience with somebody who is that powerful and that influential and, and do it easily. There are very few people who would be in that category. And if I did send him a letter and I got a response, it wouldn't be from him. It would be from somebody on his staff. And he wouldn't know anything that I said in that letter or anything. But with, with God, it's so different. I think about what is stated in several passages of scripture about the power and the difference that prayer makes. And James, in talking about praying for the sick, in talking about us calling upon the elders to, to anoint someone if they are sick and, and them being healed and confessing our sins to one another and God providing forgiveness and God making a difference in the lives of us as we go to him in prayer, he makes this statement, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. In Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3, Paul there has a prayer for the Ephesians. He begins it in the first chapter, and then he goes to the third chapter, and he continues that about asking God to help us to know and understand the love and the power that's at work within us. And toward the end of that verse, it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all could we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. We believe that prayer is powerful. And yet, most of us, at one time or another, we've struggled with it. And I'm hoping that in this series, as Noah continues these sermons over the next several weeks, that all of us will go into this series with an attitude that even if things are going well for me in my personal spiritual disciplines and in my prayer life, that if it's good, it can be better. 
And if it's not what I want it to be, that it can grow and it can be different. And so I encourage you as we move forward in this series, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter how you feel right now about your prayer life and your relationship to God, I pray that we'll all apply the things that we talk about over the next several weeks. Because I do know that when I sent out that survey with the questions, I guess it was the first part of last week, and we've gotten more responses since I did this. And by the way, this is anonymous. I had, I had a lady come up to me, and, and a, a fine lady, but she was kind of skeptical. And she said, come on, is that, is that really anonymous? And I said, absolutely, it is anonymous. When those answers come to us, they say anonymous right on there. And I guess maybe if you were a computer forensics expert in IT, maybe you could figure that out. But, but we do not know who, who answered. And almost, in fact, I think about 80 of you uh, answered that survey. And so when we asked you, how are you doing in your prayer life? We got a number of responses. Uh, the top one was, it's very fulfilling and satisfying, mostly fulfilling and satisfying, average with ups and downs. I only pray occasionally with mixed results. And then the last one here is, I seldom pray and see few benefits. And nobody said that. Out of 80 people who responded, nobody said, I seldom pray and I don't see any real benefits in it. And with the responses that we get got after I uh, pull these results up, we did get a few more responses. We're just almost exactly evenly divided between very fulfilling and satisfying, mostly fulfilling, and on the other side, average with ups and downs, and I only pray occasionally with mixed results. So about half of us who responded, and it's probably representative of the whole, responded by saying, I struggle with it. I have my ups and downs. I, 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 don't, I don't pray the way I, I, I should. I don't experience in my prayer life what I'd like to feel. But I think that all of us can learn from this. And the question comes up, why do we struggle with prayer? I mean, something, it, I mean, if you believe this, something that is meant to be so powerful and make a difference and, and be so good and, and such a blessing, why do we struggle with it? The fact is we do. We're human. We're weak. We struggle sometimes with things we don't fully know or understand or how it works. I had a conversation with someone just this past week, a brother here at Northeast, and he said, brother, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm struggling right now with my faith. I'm, I'm struggling with how prayer fits into all of this. He's been praying about something related to his life that is causing concern and anxiety and difficulty, and he felt like there was an answer that, that he was blessed with and happy about, and then a wrench is thrown in the situation, and he said, I'm struggling. But he's not, not the only one here who feels that way. If I asked you to raise your hand, you'd probably raise your hand and say, yeah, there have been times I've struggled with prayer. So what is it? What is it? I, I love what one of you said on the survey. And one of you said this, the biggest hurdle for me is understanding how prayer works. I love spending time with God in prayer, but when it comes to asking God for help, it seems very random whether help is given or not. This is especially true in situations where it feels like God should help. Like when someone's suffering an illness. I believe in prayer and I pray frequently, but sometimes it feels like it doesn't really do anything. And I appreciate your honesty and there were many others in terms of your response and what you said in the survey, might not have been exactly what this person says, but a lot of you said things that were similar. So we have roadblocks, and we have barriers. 
Sometimes there are misconceptions. Sometimes it's not maybe fully understanding everything that God wants us to know and understand about prayer. And there are other times it may be something in my own life. I mean, Peter says in the book of 1 Peter in talking about our prayer lives, he speaks to husbands about treating your wife with, with gentleness and respect and, and honoring her and, and treating her in the right way. And Peter says, you do this so that your prayers won't be hindered. So there may be times when there are roadblocks in our own lives because of our own uh, wrong or sinful attitudes, and that can hurt our relationship with God and can affect our prayer life. But you know, what might some of these roadblocks be? I think this is one, and a couple of you mentioned this, in your survey, you said, I feel unworthy sometimes. I look at my own life, my own sin, my own inadequacies, and sometimes I just don't feel worthy of approaching God. And the, the fact is, on one level, there are not, there's not a single one of us who can say we are worthy to approach a holy, perfect God. We all sin and fall short of His will and glory. There's not a single one of us who can say that we can approach God and we can talk to God because of how we have performed or all the good things we have done. You know, God is, God is holy and God is, is perfect. And in a very real sense, we are unworthy. And so the idea about approaching God the Father in prayer through Jesus or in Jesus' name is saying, I can't do this because of myself or on my own. I can only do it because of what Jesus has done for me and the price that he's paid. And so you may struggle with that, but keep that in mind. Here's another one. I've tried it and it hasn't worked. And so I don't know where that attitude may come from in an individual, but sometimes it comes from the place of really wanting something and, and believing that that's the right thing, and that's what God wants for me, and that's what God would want. And I'm praying about it, and it doesn't come about, and so I feel like maybe it's not, not working right, or he's not hearing it right, or... You know, I, I, just, it, I just feel like it just isn't working. Amen. I'm disappointed with the answers. And so as we think about that, we think about something else as well. What about this one? God is sovereign, and he's going to do what he wants to do anyway. And I think maybe there are different versions of this, but I think in the, in the back of our minds, sometimes when we pray, we're thinking even when Jesus spoke and he talked about prayer and how prayer works and about us being persistent in prayer, even in that passage in the book of Matthew, Jesus says, your Father in heaven knows what you need even before you ask. And so we think sometimes when we pray, we, we pray, it, you know, I, I want this to happen, but, you know, may God's will be done. If God's going to do what he's going to do anyway, and he is sovereign, and he knows what's best, there might be a part in the mind of some of us, you know, why do I need to do that anyway? And, and besides that, when I pray, how do I know? How do I know if what I prayed about that comes about was going to happen anyway? Whether I prayed about it or not, interpreting how God may or may not answer a prayer and when he does or does not intervene, sometimes is a little difficult and mysterious, isn't it? And honestly, we look at the world, a lot of what is going on in the world and the randomness and the, the disasters and the suffering, and we say, well, why, why do it anyway? God intervening or not intervening, sometimes it's so hard or difficult to understand, I, I just don't know. But more than anything, listen, when we asked you what your greatest obstacle was in having a fulfilling and meaningful prayer life, this is what you said, more than anything else from, from you all. In one word or another, you said something to the effect, I like the discipline and I let other things get in the way. 
So for, for many of you, it's not necessarily that you're struggling with how the providence of God and how he answers and it doesn't answer fit into all this. Some of you, it is. But it's just this reality that I know it's good, I know there's a value in it, yet I have a hard time sometimes with it. In fact, here's some quotes directly from you. One of you uh, answered when we asked, what's a hindrance in your prayer life? One of you said laziness, pure and simple. One of you said, not enough structure to my prayer life, too tired, I'm forgetful, so many other things that have to be done. One of you says, I get distracted so easily, even when I'm in a quiet room by myself. I find my mind wandering to all the things I need to do, losing my train of thought. I struggle to feel like my whole heart and mind is present in the moment. Can you identify with any of the statements there? I know three of you can. Because three of you said it. But it's representative of what many of you said about prayer. So whatever the obstacles are, I want to just kind of make, take a little pause right here and mention two things that I believe will help us stay motivated in persevering in the spiritual discipline and growing in the effect it's having in our lives and the lives of others. The first one is this, Jesus prayed. And he didn't just pray on isolated occasions. Jesus prayed with discipline and regularly, and he was the son of God. And I know what maybe some of you may be thinking about that. Well, if he is the son of God and he has this perfect relationship with the father, why... You know, why did he even need, need to pray? Because I believe that in his humanity, he placed upon himself limitations on the exercise of that deity in terms of how he lived. He prayed because he was a human being. He was God in the flesh. But it's not like he leaned into being God to get things done that he couldn't do as a regular human being. He truly needed prayer. And so found times where he would pray regularly and, and went aside in his life. But on every other occasion when he's performing miracles, when he's baptized, when he's struggling with difficulties, all of those situations, when he's choosing the apostles, he's praying. And he's not doing it just for an example for us. He needed to pray. And if the Son of God, God in the flesh, in this life, in this world, needed to pray, we need to pray too. Amen to that? What about the early church? One of the things we're asking you to do in your life groups, one of the questions, one of the angles on the life group curriculum is to take a deeper look at what the early church did. And the early church was a praying church. And I find it interesting that we call the book of Acts the book of Acts. But those acts are often acts of prayer. And everything that the early church did, from selecting a new apostle, to waiting for God's power in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, to dealing with people who were in crisis, carrying out ministry, appointing leaders. The church was constantly in prayer. Constantly in prayer. So, as we move forward in this series, I want to just do a couple of quick hits on this question, how we define prayer. Now, I want, to, I want you to keep all these ideas in mind as we move forward in terms of how we apply these things. There are going to be so many things that we cover over the next few, few weeks. The, just to give you a dictionary definition of prayer, it says a solemn request for help or the expression of thanks addressed to God or an object of worship. Okay, that's fine, that's fine and good, but we know it's a lot deeper than that, right? 
It's a lot deeper and a lot more meaningful than just a dictionary definition or just a few things we get from the Bible. The first thing to remember is this. Prayer is the awareness of God's presence. I think as much as anything else in terms of our own personal prayer lives and our prayer life corporately as a body of people, this is one of the most important things to remember. And I know the verse here in Philippians 4, we usually, don't we usually, when we're quoting it, don't we usually start with the do here? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We usually start right there. Right before it is this statement. And this is going to be a key in terms of how we grow and how we develop in our personal prayer lives. It's remembering this reality that God is near and that God is present. That's the reality right now. An illustration that, that I saw several years ago about this is you think about right now, all around us are all kinds of ultraviolet, electromagnetic, waves and signals of all kinds. I mean, we are literally surrounded by millions of signals. We have the wireless, we have satellites, we have television signals that are buzzing through the auditorium right now, radio signals, signals from the sun. All, all, you know, all of these signals are all around us and yet we need to know that we have it. We need a receiver or something to receive that. And so sometimes simply just remembering that, that God is near and that God is present. Every moment of every day is going to help me in my prayer life. And then there's this one. Prayer is communication rooted in a relationship. Paul says that those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. You receive the Spirit of, the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Dear Father. That Aramaic expression is closely akin to the word that we might use today, referring to our fathers as Daddy. And so in the Old Testament, yeah, people were called to prayer, but a lot of the Old Testament, you see more of a kind of a proxy approach in religion, and you had a lot of things that were done in reference to God that was going through the priests. You even had the God's presence in the temple that was, that was so off limits, only the high priest could go in there once a year with a sacrifice. And yet, today, through Jesus, we can approach God as a loving father. I like the response of one of you when we ask you your definition of prayer. You said this. Talking to God, and that's supposed to be a capital G, by the way. That's my typo, I'm sorry. Talking to God who listens and does not tell you later, or you've said that before, like my husband does to me. <laughs> And the only thing I have to say to that is, Jeannie, you have a lot of nerve writing that. <laughs> we have trouble with communication, don't we? And we also know that good communication or a good relationship is based on good communication. And we also know just because you're present with someone and you are physically in their presence, it doesn't mean you're close. You may sit next to the same person every day at work and exchange maybe a few pleasantries and you're with that person many, many hours during the day. It doesn't mean you're close to them. We all understand what it means to be close to someone and what a relationship with someone means. And I know we struggle with communication. 
you know, I can only focus on a certain amount of things, and if I'm talking to someone and someone else is talking or I want to talk to this person, I get distracted. I just don't handle that e e easily. But God doesn't have that problem. You remember the scene, this is from a movie several years ago. You remember the movie Bruce Almighty? Do, do any of y'all remember that? And Jim Carrey was a character in that movie, and he just had all kinds of problems with how God was doing things. And he felt if he had the ability and the power that God had, he could handle things a lot better. And I remember one of those scenes where Morgan Freeman had, had talked to him and gave him the ability to do things. He's, he's at that computer terminal, remember? And he's starting to get prayers coming in. And at first he's doing really good. He's getting his request, but then they're like coming in a mile a minute and he's having a hard time processing it. And the fact is, it, at least the God that I believe in, I believe he doesn't have a problem with attention deficit. And I believe he can handle my prayer and other people's prayers all at the same time. And I know sometimes we say, listen, this is just not my personality. I'm not a talker. I'm not, I'm not a communicator. I'm not a verbal person. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think? And, and if, you, if you think, if you're not a talker, you're a thinker. And you think things. And you can communicate with God. I, I remember, uh, I can't remember how long ago it was, but I was talking to Jean. Maybe I was with Jean and Sheila. And, and Jean, it, it was known as a man of few words, and still is. He, you know, he talks now, but Jean was not a big talker. And the subject came up about saying, I love you. And I think he looked at Sheila or said something to the effect well, listen, I, I told you years ago that I love you. <laughs> and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> but there, we know there are times we need to hear it. And we need to say it. God created us that way. And if we're going to have a healthy relationship with God, we need to have a conversational relationship with God. Okay, last, let me go through these last two quickly, is this, prayer is personal. And what I mean by that is, I don't, I don't want anybody, as you explore more deeply the discipline of prayer and how you apply it in your life, I don't want you to feel like, I have to do this just like somebody else. And I believe we have people in this congregation who are, who, are, who are gifted and, and are more naturally bent toward prayer. They are our prayer warriors. They may pray more than m many of us pray. They may do it in circumstances that we would never dream of, and that's fine. I'm not asking you, and God is, God is not asking, it's not me, but it's God asking us to be like everybody else. He's saying wherever you are, and all of us have a routine to try to see where that routine could be a rut and how things might be better and be willing to try it to do something differently. And so if you're saying, you know, I've tried it, it didn't work, it's not working good in my life, maybe you need to do something a little differently. It might not be exactly what somebody else is doing, but don't be like that child who says, I don't like that food and we tell that child, just try it. You might like it. And they look at it, and they don't like the way it looks, and they try it, and they might, they might like it. Don't be afraid to try something. And last but not least, remember this. Prayer is a gift and not a burden. What I don't want, what we don't want more than anything in this series is for us to go into this thinking like, oh, here's another thing I have to do as a Christian, and I'm not doing it right, and, and you know, we're just dreading it. Prayer is meant to be a gift that's shared between people who know and love each other. I remember Mark, Mark Dugan for years, his mother died, and he communicated with them. His mother was difficult to communicate with because of some of the physical problems.
problems that she had later in life. But I remember Mark, every day, he called his dad. His dad, a great man. And I know every day he called, there wasn't always something, you know, astonishing or, or noteworthy or... But they were just talking about life. And I believe that's the way God the Father wants us to be with Him. And so don't look at prayer in the way of like God giving you a, a shovel or a mattock or a pickaxe and saying, okay, go out back and dig this ditch and dig up all the rocks. Prayer is a gift that's given to us to be unwrapped. And the more we view it that way, the more we're going to be willing to do some things differently to grow in this discipline that will help us and will help others as well. And I close. This is my last, well, my next to last slide. <laughs> you know, I don't get to preach too much, you know, seven, eight times a year. <laughs> so this is what we'll be talking about. Coming up, I want you to take a look at this. I'm looking forward to what Noah is going to be talking about over the next several weeks. Yeah, you know, we'll be talking about fasting and, and our, our posture and position in prayer that can make a big difference. And and some of the questions I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon, some of these things we struggle with. How does God answer prayer and not? And why does He do things this way? That's going to be talked about too in this series. So I look uh, forward to exploring these things together. And so I close with this screen. This is what one of you said. And, and I love this state. And by the way, you can come up to me and tell me you wrote some of these things if you want to afterwards. I don't know who you are, but whoever said this, this is so good. Prayer is a way to commune with God, although I do believe prayer can change things. I think the most important purpose of prayer is to be changed by God. And I say amen to that. You know, prayer is a request, is asking God for things. And I believe there are times when we don't ask, and we don't ask in faith, we don't receive because we don't ask. But prayer is so much more than that. And if we go into this with the right attitude, God is going to change all of us for the better. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you. Uh, so much for the gift of prayer. And as we uh, move forward in our own lives, as we see where we are in relationship to you, and we thank you, God, first of all, that you are near, and that you are real, that you hear us, and that we can be blessed in ways perhaps that we haven't even thought or imagined uh, through this wonderful gift. We bring our hearts and our lives before you as we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. And before we sing, let me remind you that we are always ready to help you in whatever way we can encourage you on your journey. We want to partner with you. If you feel like you are ready to take a step and make a commitment to Jesus and be baptized into him, let us know. We will take care of that need. Uh, if you're just struggling with something and want one of our shepherds to pray with you after service to mor this morning as we sing that last song, one of our shepherds will be in this room to the left and they'll pray with you and encourage you in prayer. Whatever that need is, be sure to let us know. Thank you very much.